U.S. President Donald Trump has no qualms about wanting to revive American industry to bring the nation back to an era where manufacturing was king. But many economists say that industry and the jobs associated with it aren't coming back. Some say the future lies with tech and what they call the weightless economy. But what exactly is it? Here's a closer look. The weightless economy refers to the products and services that have no physical weight. Computer software, for example. In developed countries, intellectual capital, not manufactured goods, represents an ever-increasing proportion of GDP. Weightless economies have two main characteristics. One, it costs a lot to develop and market products like video games, an app, or streaming music platforms. Two, weightless products can be distributed infinitely at little to no cost. When Apple, Google, or Tencent release a new app, they can sell it and deliver it to anyone in the world via the internet. Experts predict the weightless economy will help developed countries double the size of their GDP by 2036. Now for more on the weightless economy, we're joined by Brian Shaitkin, live from New York. He's a senior economist from the Conference Board. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Rochelle. So just how important would you say the weightless economy is when it comes to global economic growth? The concept of the weightless economy is fundamental to thinking about how consumers consume, how businesses invest, and also uh, how businesses are going to evolve and how competition is going to evolve going forward. The economist Michael Mandel of the Progressive Policy Institute comes up with this distinction between what is called the physical economy. Uh, those industries that actually produce physical output and the digital economy, which is what we're talking about when we think about the weightless economy, which refers to those sectors of the economy that produce digital outputs or weightless outputs. And what we're seeing increasingly is this blurring of a distinction between the physical economy and the digital economy. So for instance, I was out on a run on Sunday using Under Armour shoes, and I had the opportunity then to use an app called Map My Run. And so that is a case where you see the movement up from a purely physical product into a digital output. Right. And that's sort of the transfer that we're talking about when we refer to the weightless economy. And that's why it's so fundamental, exactly because of that blurring that takes place. So as we look at this, which countries would you say should we expect to see the largest growth in terms of this weightless momentum we're seeing? So I don't think you could say a, one particular country will have... Uh, will be favored in terms of growth going forward, in terms of weightless... Uh, products. Instead, the way to look at it is what is each country's advantage from a regulatory and growth perspective? So a country like Kenya, for example, has been able to use M-Pesa to entirely skip uh, having brick and mortar banks. Instead, you sort of reach a stage where you have digital uh, movement of money throughout the economy over mobile phones. So that's an example of being able to skip a stage of development. Whereas, of course, in the U.S., I mean, you're going to continue to see, uh, because of the ease of being able to set up businesses and the amount of high-quality digital workforce that's present, you're going to continue to see uh, the establishment of large tech firms and that being a major driver of economic growth going forward. So I don't think it's about looking at one particular country. It's instead looking at what are the particular characteristics that could advantage one country to be able to develop along a certain way in thinking about how the weightless economy is going to benefit a given economy. Now, one thing that does make it easier is regulation. So as you look at some of the regulations in, in countries that are really incentivizing companies to, to step up their, their movement in the weightless economy, how are regulations keeping up with this? Well, it's not always in the way that you would expect. So in the U.S., I think one of the reasons why uh, big tech firms have tended to come out of the U.S. economy is that there's been less of a focus on uh, 
maintaining a certain level of competition. Uh, many of these weightless economy firms benefit from network effects. It's simply the case that in the digital economy, you're going to tend to have uh, users converging around one standard. So the lack of a larger, more sophisticated antitrust enforcement regime and sort of worrying about uh, the fact that one particular firm may become dominant in a sector has helped the U.S. On the other hand, in terms of thinking about labor policy, I think it's important to keep in mind that, that having the gig economy grow and having easy access to health care that's decoupled right. from uh, one's work is also very important. And that's an area where many European countries would have an advantage over the U.S. in terms of establishing a robust gig economy environment and being able to help for help uh, individuals to be able to endure the kind of risk to be able to not have a permanent job. So I think right. that's one advantage, one place where Europe has a bit of an advantage. Now let's also look at some of the challenges. We, we're seeing that critics are saying that with this growing online presence, this means a lot more um, energy consumption, which could trigger a bigger carbon footprint. And there's also the potential to perhaps widen the wealth gap between those who are able to access these products and those who can't. What would you say are the really big challenges in the weightless economy? So I would say your concern about the carbon footprint is to me less of a concern because when you look at how utility grids operate, the main challenge is being able to provide power right now at peak hours because that's uh, because users are going to converge in terms of their use around certain hours. Instead, what large data centers end up doing is using power during the day in a flatter way, or they can even move power consumption towards the evening. So as a result, they're well equipped to be able to be served by alternative energy sources, solar and wind in particular. So I think that's less of a concern. What's more of a concern is the question of inequality. Because as I said, uh, network effects are paramount in the weightless economy. So as a result, wealth is going to converge among certain firms. Uh, High-powered uh, human capital also is absolutely critical. These are firms that rely on having the best and the brightest people. And as a result, we've seen uh, the growth of what's been called in the literature a superstar economy. So right. whereas you see that right now in entertainment and sports, you're increasingly seeing that in tech. And I think that's a very important change to consider when you're thinking about the weightless economy. All right. Well, thank you so much for your insights. Brian Shaikin, Senior Economist at the Conference Board. Thank you, Rochelle.